Bibles this morning to the book of Isaiah, chapter 12. Book of Isaiah, chapter 12. My message is entitled, That Day is Now This Day. You got that, Tom? That day is now this day. Isaiah chapter 12. I'm going to preach the whole chapter. Whew. I'll tell you, this is one of the toughest things to put together to kind of line it up. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Isaiah chapter 12, beginning with verse number 1. And he says, In that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. For thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah, or Yahovah, is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord. Call upon His name, declare His doings among the people. Make mention that His name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord, for He hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. We all ought to say hallelujah for that. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay. O oh God, I pray that you'd bless, bless thy word. Move in the heart of thy people, Lord God. Anoint the message. And Father, I pray as it goes forth over the airwaves, you'd move in the hearts of the people who watch it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Now, beloved, I've taught you for years that the book of Isaiah is known as the fifth gospel or the gospel according to the prophet Isaiah. Why? Why do people call that that? They call it that, beloved, because it speaks so much about the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that would, we would get through His name. He speaks more about the coming of the Messiah than any other prophet, any other book throughout the Old Testament. Now, you need to understand something contextually about uh, Isaiah chapter 12. Chapter 12 is now the capstone of the truth spoken about in chapter 11 about the lineage and person and kingdom of the Messiah. Now, in chapter 11, it shows that He would be a root that would descend from the stem and branch of Jesse. In other words, the father of King David, and that his coming kingdom would be characterized by peace and righteousness, depending, uh, excuse me, uh, that both Jews and Gentiles would flow into it. In other words, when Messiah came, he did not just come to redeem Israel, he came to redeem the whole world. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, throughout chapter 11, or let me, let me back up, throughout chapters 1 through 11, probably even better, Isaiah repeatedly uses the recurring refrain, in that day. That Greek word is yom, not yom, like day, but yom. It's a different word altogether, meaning at that time, in that period, or in that era or age. And he uses it in three different ways, depending upon the context of the narrative that's under discussion. In other words, if you really want to find out what it means, you have to stay within the context, read the narrative, and then you will uh, know. Now, he uses it to prophetically refer to three different things. Number one, to God's coming day of judgment on Israel by Assyria and Babylon for their wicked and impenitent sins. And ironically, beloved, their captivity hadn't even happened yet. It was all still future, but God was revealing to Isaiah that this was indeed going to happen. Of course, we know in 722 B.C., the northern kingdom of Israel, Samaria, the capital of it, went into Assyrian captivity. And then 586 B.C., we know that Babylon, excuse me, yes, conquered Judah, and Judah went into captivity at that time. Number two, beloved, it's used for God's ultimate deliverance from Assyrian and Babylonian captivity and the restoration of the penitent remnant of Israel back to the land. Now imagine his uh, Isaiah looking down the corridors of time, and he does, beloved, he sees them go into captivity, and also he also sees them come back. So he uses that phrase, in that day, in that day. But thirdly, and most importantly, beloved, the phrase, in that day, prophetically means the coming of the Messiah, his spiritual and eternal kingdom that he'd set up at not only his first advent, but ultimately at his second advent. Now listen to me now, you cannot separate the second advent from the first advent, amen? Nor the first advent from the second advent. Because, beloved, remember, <clears throat> what he's talking about here is this, that when he looks down the corridors of time, he's seeing uh, Jesus doing his redemptive work that he needs to do, and the 
ultimate establishment, not only of his spiritual kingdom, but also of his eternal kingdom. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, this is known when a prophet looks down the corridors of time like this, this is known by theologians. It's called by theologians the prophetic perspective. What did I say it was called? The prophetic perspective. Now, it's important that you understand this com concept. That's when a prophet looks down the corridors of time and he sees two different prophecies as two different mountain ranges, but he sees them now blended together as being only one because he does not see the valley in between that separates them. Now, the prophetic mountain ranges here refer to Christ's first and second advent, and the valley signifies the time in between them. In other words, this is the first advent, mountain range. Isaiah sees that. But he also sees another one kind of sticking up, and he can't tell if it's one or two. But he doesn't see between it what? The time of the first advent. He doesn't see it. So he sees that's called prophetic perspective as he's looking down the corridors of time. That's why you'll see throughout the Old Testament many prophecies are blended together. They speak uh, perfect examples. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Malachi talks about the coming of the Lord's first advent and the second advent, but it's in one prophetic message. Would you say amen out there? Now I want you to look at verses 1 and 4 again. He says, And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Drop down to verse 4. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name. Now, beloved, that phrase, in that day, yom, here most specifically refers to Israel's ultimate deliverance from the penalty and power of their sins and their restoration to God through the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Isaiah says here, in that day, he explicitly, mean, explicitly means this. He's saying, in that era of the Messiah, in that age of the Messiah, in that period of time of the Messiah when he comes to redeem and rescue and restore not only Old Testament Israel, beloved, but also the New Testament Israel that would be brought in, included in that, that spiritual remnant uh, of Old Testament Israel. In other words, church, uh, beloved, coming to, <coughs> excuse me, redeem, rescue, and restore uh, to God. Now, the prophetic perspective Isaiah sees here as he looks into the future is both the commencement of the first kingdom that Christ would set up, that we're in right now, and also the consummation of the Messiah's kingdom. In other words, beloved, he sees both the first and second advents of the Lord Jesus Christ being one grand event. Remember, he can't see that valley of time in between them that separates them, but these, uh, two, uh, he sees them as two separate events. So what Isaiah is telling us here is this. He's saying that in that day, that is, uh, that day and now, that is now this day, the first advent of the Messiah has come. Now he said this in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and you know the text. He says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counsel, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth, even forever, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. In the Gospels we see that the, the apostles said, now they remembered that the zeal of the Lord would be upon him. They were quoting back in Isaiah. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, he's saying that that day is now this day in which we now live and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying that that day is now this day, the church age, the era of the Messiah. He's saying that that day is ultimately also this day, that is the coming second advent when Messiah comes back to climax earth's history and consummate his redemptive plan for man, and then, of course, establish the eternal kingdom of God uh, on this earth, in a new heaven and a new earth. Boy, I'm looking forward to that. How about you? Wherein dwelleth righteousness, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. Hey, beloved, this is why or what we ought to celebrate at Christmas, and it's the incarnation you and I know and the redemption of the very Son of God when He came. I'm saying that that day is now this day. Now, you know, it's not wrong. Everybody loves Christmas. There's nothing wrong with loving Christmas, beloved. And sure, we love the trees and the lights, and I love to see the And I love the songs, don't you? I love to sing them. In fact, I was coming out here today, and I'm kind of scrolled on my radio, and I found a nice station out of Boston, uh, 106.7, I guess it is, that just all Christmas uh, until the day of Christmas. 
And we love the celebrations, we love the parties, and we love the fellowships with our family and friends. But the very heart of Christmas, we must never forget, is the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that day is now this day. Would you say amen out there? And we know that he's the reason for celebrating Christmas. He's the season for celebrating Christmas. Now listen to me. And he's the cohesion for celebrating Christmas. Would you say amen? Now there's four truths about that day is now this day and what it means. Number one, I want you to see it means it's a day of consolation. It's a day of consolation. I want you to look at verse 1 and 4a. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Thou wast angry with me. Thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Drop down to verse 4a. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name. Now let me stop you right there. Now notice at the end of verse 4, uh, uh, no, not verse 4, what am I, verse 1, excuse me. At the end of verse 1 is the words, comfortest me. Nakham is the Hebrew phrase. And it means to compassionately console, to comfort with solace, to ease one's discomfort and distress. Now why did Isaiah, why was God told, or tell, uh, uh, did he tell Isaiah to say this? Because Israel had greatly sinned, so God punished them by sending them into Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. In other words, God has a way of using unsaved people, unsaved nations, as his chastening rod to deal with his people. Throughout the Old Testament, God did it again and again and again. Uh, we see how God would send the worst pagans in the world when his people fell into sin, but they wouldn't listen to the prophets. They would not repent. They wouldn't turn back to God. They did their own thing, so to speak. And so, beloved, the Assyrians and Babylonians then took them into captivity. They became prisoners. They became slaves. And they thought that they had gone down in Assyria and Babylon. They thought they had gone all alone. God weepingly says, I'll go with you. I'm going to go with you. I won't leave you alone. I'm going to go with you. And nevertheless, beloved, even though they were in captivity and God told them, pray for the city. And that's what we need to do for America, by the way. God says, you pray for the city so you can have peace in that city. So you can, uh, you can uh, populate, you can grow bigger and larger because I'm coming back and I'm going to deliver you and I'm going to bring you back into the land. Now, beloved, when Israel was in captivity, they were scared. And they were discouraged. They were depressed. And they thought that God had now utterly forsaken them. They thought God had forgotten about them. But praise the Lord, he hadn't. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, and he's quoting, by the way, because he says, And God hath said, all the way back yonder in the Old Testament, he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say that the Lord is my helper. Would you say amen? God says, you got my word on it. I won't leave you, and I won't forsake you. Now, you may leave and forsake me, <laughs> okay? And that's dangerous business. But beloved, God said to them, I will not forsake you. I'll bring anyone back to the land who gets their life right, gets their heart right. God says, I'll bring them back to the land. And so Isaiah promised them that they'd be released from their exile and captivity and return to the land of Israel. So why? So there could be a people prepared for the coming of the Lord. Remember, the Messiah had to come to Israel. That's the solid threat of redemption that we see throughout the whole Old Testament pointing to where Christ is going to come. So God had to have a people back in the land of Israel, or Yisrael, the way the Jews would say it, so uh, uh, they could welcome the coming of the Lord. Now in Amos chapter 4, verse 12, he talks about that, and he exhorts them and us. He says this, he says, prepare to meet thy God. Well, but he didn't just say, get ready to meet your God. He said what? Prepare to meet thy God. The question is this, beloved, are you prepared? Are you prepared to meet and greet the Lord when he returns? You see, God wanted his Israel to be ready for the coming of the Messiah. And God wanted them to know that he hadn't forsaken them. That in that day, that in that era, that in that age when Messiah comes to them, he treat them with compassion, praise the Lord. And he treat them, beloved, with mercy, praise the Lord. And he treat them with forgiveness, praise the Lord. He'd comfort them and console them because they had been in captivity and they thought they had been forsaken by God. But God says, I'm going to take care of you in this great time of stress and distress that you've been in. 
And when the Messiah come, beloved, the Bible said he would come with healing in his wings. Would you say amen out there? He'd be the son of righteousness who'd come with healing in his wings. Oh, hear me now. That day refers to the first advent. And that day is now this day in which we now live. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, I want you to notice in verse number one, the very last word is that pronoun me. Now, that pronoun me here is first person singular. This makes it intensely personal. This makes it intensely applicable to every single one of us that are sitting here today. And those who are watching by television who will hear this on just a CD. Well, let me ask you a question, beloved. Has God ever been angry with you? I mean, and dealt with you, and then when you learned your lesson and you thought he had forsaken you, instead he comforted you. Has it ever happened, beloved? Any, excuse me, every one of us could say amen to that. I know I could. I know you could. That God, when he did his business and taught us that lesson, beloved, ultimately he came along and he encouraged us. Amen? Now, why did he do that? Because after the chastening us, God then benevolently and unexpectedly poured out his kindness and his mercy and grace and compassion and blessing on us to encourage us and inspire us and cheer us up and let us know that he still loves us and we still belong to him. So we will persevere in the faith. Amen? Oh, beloved, if you don't think you're loved, you'll walk away. If you don't think anyone cares about you, you'll walk away, won't you? But God said to Israel, I want you to know that I love you. I'm going to give you mercy in that day. I'm going to give you compassion in that day. I'm going to console you in that day. Would you say amen out there? And that day is now this day. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, I want you to note two sub-points on the point number one here. Number one, beloved, that day is now this day. It's to be a time of the devout praise of the faithful. The devout praise of the faithful. Look what he says in verse 1a. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Now, beloved, notice that uh, throughout this church age and on a daily basis, Hebrews chapter 13 says that God's people, Jew and Gentile believers in the Messiah, are to be daily offering up to God the sacrifice of praise. Would you say amen out there? And this sacrifice of praise, notice in your text, is to be directed to Yehovah. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. All uppercase letters. In other words, beloved, the sovereign and supreme eternal self-existing one. The only uncaused cause and creator and redeemer God of the universe who rules and reigns over all mankind, but especially over his people. Amen? That's what Yehovah or capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D means. It is not capital L, small o, R, D, like Adonai. No, no. This is all uppercase letters pointing to the only eternal and supreme self-existent one. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, and may I remind you, may I remind you that the Jesus of the New Testament is the Yehovah of the Old Testament incarnate. And Jesus is God in the flesh. He's both fully God and fully man. And he's deity, I've told you, enshrined and enshrouded and enmeshed in humanity. The church fathers said it like this. When they got together in the third century, beloved, they had to have a council, the Council of Chalcedon. And they said, we need to really develop the doctrine of who this Jesus really is. Because Arianism in the second century had risen up. That's the modern day Jehovah Witness. They believe that Christ is of a like or similar homoousia uh, substance, but he's not homoousia, of the same essence, substance, and subsistence of God. So they formulated this doctrine that Christ is God in the flesh. And this is what they said about him, beloved. He is God of true God. He is light of true light. He is life of true life. He is the God-man, the Theanthropos, who created and redeemed us. The Apostle John picks up on that in John chapter 1 and verse, verses 1 through 3. He says this, In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life, and that life, he says, was the light of men. Would you say amen out there? But he didn't stop there. 
in that same chapter, beloved, in chapter one, uh, chapter one, verse 14, he says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, the only begotten of the Father, and he was full of God's grace and God's truth. Would you say amen? God in the flesh dwelling amongst us. That's what we mean by Emmanuel. You see, therefore, we're to totally offer up to God. It says here, praise. That word yada, praise, means to laud him with genuine, heartfelt admiration and thanksgiving and acclamation of who he is and what he's now done for us. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we're to praise Christ as our creator, amen, because he made us. We're to praise Christ every day as our redeemer and our deliverer. Think of the things he has delivered you from. All the pain, all the problems, all the stress, all these things. And the Bible says we're to praise Him every day as our liberator. He liberated us from the kingdom of darkness. And we're to praise Him every day as being our blessed Lord and Savior, beloved. And daily, the Bible says, we're to love Him. And daily, we're to adore Him. And daily, we're to worship Him. And daily, we're to honor Him. Would you say amen? Beloved, listen to me now. That day is now this day to do it. That day is now this day to do it. Don't you miss that. You know, why should we do it? Because the Bible says, listen, He inhabits the very praises of His people. Not only that, and that God says it is comely to praise the Lord for His goodness and grace towards us and His mercy towards us which always endures forever. Huh? And that's something to praise God about. You know, King David loved to praise God. You can't read the Psalms without seeing it. And I could have quoted you a hundred scriptures, but I won't. But I love what he said in Psalm 9.1. He said, I will praise thee, O Lord. But he says this, with my whole heart. I don't do it half-heartedly. I do it with my whole heart. Would you say amen out there? And in verse 2 of chapter 9, he continues. He says, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name. And then he ends, O Most High. Would you say amen out there? If you read Psalm 107, Psalm four times, four times, beloved, David says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Beloved, has God been good to you? You say, yes, preacher. Then why don't you praise the Lord? Don't get down in the dumps, beloved. This is the time of the where the sun's not bright all the time and people kind of get depressed. But you know, beloved, listen to me. God hasn't left you. God hasn't forsaken you. God promises he will comfort and console you. Would you say amen out there? You know what? I'll tell you what I do. I praise him every day for my salvation. And I praise him for my life and I praise him for my health. Praise the Lord. And I praise him for my home and my family and my friends and my job, beloved, and my money. You can praise him for your church and you can praise him for your pastor. That'd be me. <laughs> You see, beloved, the Bible says that angels praise the Lord. Listen to me now. The Bible says all creation praises the Lord. The Bible says the very animals praise the Lord. You know, as I watch them, my, mother, my wife and I, my mother and I, my wife and I, she's like my mother, okay? You don't do that, Joan. And we watch uh, National Geographic, and we see, uh, when you look in the Serengeti, See how God, how he feeds the animals and they have the dry spell. Then God brings the rains and the water comes and the, the, the uh, vegetation flourishes and the animals have drink. And of course, that's when the lions do their hunting too. But all that to say, beloved, can you imagine this God of creation in the most barren place you could imagine? Yet God brings life. And the animals wait and they wait. And you can see when the water comes, beloved, you, their eyes sparkle. They're saying, praise the Lord. Thank you. Uh, for this. Beloved, you know, men are to praise the Lord. Even unsaved men. Why? Because God is their creator. The Bible says in Psalm 150, verse 6, it commands, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And then he ends by saying, praise ye the Lord, Yehovah. Let everything that has breath, do you have breath? When's the last time you really praised the Lord? You say, well, I've got some problems in my life. I'll tell you what, beloved, you probably got more better times and bad times in your life. You ought to start praising them. Maybe these bad times will go away. What do you think? Oh, beloved, how often do you do it? How regularly do you do it? How daily do you do it? Hear me now. That day is now this day that we're to praise the Lord. We're to praise Him every morning. 
And the Bible says we're to praise him at noontime. David said he would praise him at e- in the evening and even get up at midnight and praise him. Beloved, we're to praise him every day. So sub-point number one is the devout praise of the faithful. The devout praise of the faithful. My second sub-point on the point number one is the divine propitiation of the Father. Look what he says in verse 1. Because a lot of people read this and they pass right over it. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, though thou wast angry with me, thine anger. Now get this. He says, is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Now, beloved, twice we're told about God's anger here. One time, we're talking about how it's going to be assuaged or abated. Now, the word anger, af, means that God was filled with fury. God was filled with rage and wrath toward his people for their sins. But when Messiah came, he's saying, and when they repented, God's anger would then be turned away. That Hebrew word shuv uh, means that it would now be calmed. It would be pacified. It would be appeased. Now hear me now, I don't want you to miss this. Remember, Isaiah is looking down the corridors of time. This speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ's atonement and our propitiation for our sins. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, listen to me. In the Old Testament, only the blood of animals spread on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement could temporarily cover and atone for their sins. And it could temporarily pacify God's holy wrath and anger toward sinners. But Isaiah is saying, but in that day, and that day is now this day, would you say amen? Christ has died for the propitiation of our sins on the cross to forever assuage God's uh, anger toward us. You hear me now? In 1 John chapter 1, uh, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he says this. He says, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, now listen, who is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Do you get that? In other words, he's talking about the unlimited atonement of Christ. How it would be sufficient to save all men, but only efficient to save those who repent and believe the gospel. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved... What am I saying to you? I'm saying this, that that word propitiation, hilismas, means that Christ was the vicarious and vindicating sacrifice that satisfied and appeased the divine wrath of an offended holy God, God told us for our transgressions of his law. Why did he do it? To reconcile us with himself. And that day is now this day that he's doing it. Would you say, man, he's busy about the business, fulfilling what he promised to do. Uh, in the Old Testament. You see, beloved, Christ is now our mercy seat, isn't he? He satisfied the just demands of the broken law that we, uh, that we broke to appease God's anger toward penitent sinners, to appease his fury toward penitent sinners, his anger and his wrath toward penitent sinners. You see, in the Old Testament, only the high priest once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Only he could enter the most holy place into the presence of God, and he had to go with atoning blood. He had to not only ceremonial cleanse himself, beloved, but he had to take blood and put it on his right ear, and put it on his right thumb, and put it on his right toe. And then he had to walk before the presence of God. There's the Ark of the Covenant, and he had to take the blood, and he had to put it on the altar. Why did he do it? To temporarily cover our sins, forgive us our sins, and listen to me, take away the wrath of God from us. Did you hear that? You know, people have this uncanny idea that God is just love, love, love. Now, we thank God for his love, but he's infinitely more than just love, isn't he? You see, beloved, God utterly hates sin. And God gets angry with sinners. And the Bible says God punishes sinners. But now Jesus died on the cross and he resurrected and then he ascended to heaven. And he entered into the heavenly sanctuary. And he forever stands in the presence of God for us as our great high priest, as our intercessor, our mediator, our advocate with the Father. And bless God, hear me now, as our mercy seat. He is our mercy seat. Not the lid of the Ark of the Covenant anymore. Jesus, the man of God, the Son of God, is our mercy seat. Would you say amen? Oh, if you could only get a hold of that. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying he placed his sinless and his shameless and his guiltless, blameless blood on the heavenly altar and forever atoned for our sin and assuaged God's anger forever toward us. Oh, Pastor Joel, what does this mean to me? 
It means that now we all have access to God like the high priest did. Remember, nobody else could go before the Lord except the high priest once a year. Om Yom Kippur. But now you can do it. When we pray here and we say, oh God, Heavenly Father, I'm in the heavenly sanctuary already. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, what does it mean? It means means that now we all can enter into God's sanctuary like Him, and we can stand in the presence of God as He did. You see, this is why Isaiah is telling them and telling us to praise the Lord here, because that day is now this day. Now that Messiah has come, He's opened up a whole new way to approach and worship and commune with this God. Would you say, man, out there? I don't have to bring beasts anymore, blood anymore, do this, do that. don't have to do that anymore. i just got to come to the Mashiach. The Messiah, Yehovah, and that's who he is. He's God in the flesh. Would you say amen out there? You see, that day is now this day that we can have close and intimate fellowship with God and close and intimate union and communion with God. And beloved, can you believe it? We can walk with God and talk with God and have company with God. Who would have ever thought such a thing before the coming of the Messiah? Amen. So Isaiah here foretold the New Testament times of Jesus being the propitiation for our sins and assuaging God's anger toward us. Oh, how blessed we are. Beloved, how blessed, how fortunate, how privileged we are. And bless God, how happy and how honored we are and we should be. Praise the Lord for that Christmas gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's point number one, the day of consolation. Secondly, I want you to see that... That day is now this day means it's a day of salvation. I want you to look at verses 2 and 3. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord, Yehovah, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Some three times Isaiah uses the word salvation. Beloved, he uses it there, notice, in verse number 2 twice, verse number 3 once. And that word salvation is the Hebrew word, listen to me now, Yeshua. What is it? Say it to me. Yeshua? I'm positive. Yeshua. That's Christ's Hebrew name. The salvation of God. Now, beloved, the Holy Spirit, only the Holy Spirit could have Isaiah, under divine inspiration, writes something like that. Would you say amen? But Isaiah uses the word salvation, Yeshua, two different ways here. Number one, he uses it a verb that shows Christ's constant and continuous action for us. And again, I want you to notice uh, how personal this is. Because he says, he's my salvation. Beloved, can you say like that? Christ is my deliverer. Christ is my helper. Christ is my Yehovah. Christ is my Lord and Savior. Oh, bless God. I hope you can say that here today. That Christ is my Lord and Savior, and there is none other. I hope you can say that. So, beloved, He alone is the one true living God. So that's the first way it's used. It's used as a verb. Secondly, beloved, it's used as a noun. It's used to signify the precious gift Christ gave you. That is, the gift of Himself. When the Apostle Paul thought about that in 2 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, he said this. Listen to me. He said, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Thanks be unto God. See, that's the noun. For, for, for his unspeakable gift. That's the, that's the noun I'm talking about there. Using a, you got it? His unspeakable gift. Yeah, not only of himself, but how about of his grace? How about the gift of his mercy and his, his forgiveness, beloved? How about the free gift of immortality and eternal life in the eternal kingdom of God? Hey, blessed be God, that day is now this day that we've received it. Would you say amen? You see, these people couldn't see what you and I see today. Since the Messiah came, beloved, we've seen things. The Bible says, Jesus said it, that the Old Testament kings and prophets have not seen, but they longed to see. They prophesied about it. Namely, salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah who finally came. Why? Because that day, that day is now this day, beloved, that they prophesied about. Now, i got two sub-points under point number two. That day is now this day is to be an age of faith. An age of faith. Look what he says in verse 2a. He says, Behold, God is my salvation. 
I will trust. Let me stop you right there. The word trust, batak, means to confidently and expectantly believe in, to hope for, to rely on the finished work of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save and sanctify you. In other words, he was telling Israel, don't trust in your obedience to the law. And we should uh, take heed to that statement, by the way. He's saying, don't trust in doing good works. Don't trust in you taking the sacraments. Don't trust on being religious. Don't trust on being a, a praying to the saints for your salvation and for your sanctification. They can't do one thing for you except uh, pray, and that's on this earth, and whatever God tells them to do in heaven. He says, you trust the Yehovah or Yeshua. Yehushua is really the Hebrew name, the way it would be said. You see, beloved, we need to stop trusting in the law. We must not trust in the pope or the priest or the pastor. We mustn't trust in the rabbi or the imam or the guru, but by trusting in Christ alone for our salvation. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, that day is now this day that we place our faith solely in him as our personal risen Lord and Savior. In Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 6, it says this. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Ah, that's the caveat, isn't it? He's a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. You know, we all love to quote a, a, a verse in the Old Testament. We all know it, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. But I wonder if we understand it. Solomon said this, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not unto thine own understanding, but all, in all thy ways acknowledge what? Him, and he shall direct thy paths. In all your ways acknowledge who? Him, and he is going to do what? He himself, beloved, providentially will guide you in your life. And I love Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. I love it, beloved. I was telling someone this week, I said, you want to memorize this, and you have it in your repertoire, so when you hit the wall, you can call on it. The Bible says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust thee in the Lord forever, for in the Lord, Yehovah, is everlasting strength. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, hey now, hey now, listen to me. That day is now this day to trust the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. So we say the first sub-point, beloved, was to be an age of faith. Secondly, an age of fearlessness. Look what he says in verse 2a. He says, he says uh, uh, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. You see what he's saying here? I don't want you to be afraid. Those words, not be afraid, pahad, means we're not to be fearful. We're not to be troubled or terrified that God will reject us or discard us. Or worse yet, cast us out as sinners for all the evil and wickedness that we've done when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So many people think that they have sinned so egregiously that God can't forgive them. Beloved, you cannot, hear me now, you cannot out the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you come in repentance, God will not only forgive you, He will reconcile you. Would you say amen? He doesn't want to condemn you. He doesn't want to separate you from Himself. He came to bring you into His clutches. You hear me now? You see, beloved, indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself promised this in John chapter 6, verse 37. He said that he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You mean that, that harlot, that hooker, if he comes to Jesus? Yes. What about that person that's hooked on pornography? Yes. What about that murderer? Yes. What about that kidnapper? Yes. You can't out -sin. Hear me now. You can't out -sin the blood of Christ. Amen. But you have to come to him, and you have to come to him through what? Faith. And you have to come fearless. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, it says in Hebrews 4, 16. Boldly, oh Lord, I don't deserve it. I deserve justice, but I want mercy, oh God. Mercy and grace, help me in my time of need. God says, I'll do that. I don't want you to be afraid. I'm not going to cast you out. No way. Why? Because that day is now this day that he'll pour out his mercy on you. Why? Because that day is now this day, beloved, that God will forgive and pardon you from all of your sins. Would you say amen out there? You say, but I say worst thing that could be. I can't believe what I did. What was I thinking? God says, you're right. It was horrible. Horrible. I hate it. 
But because you came to me in repentance, the blood of my son died for that. I'll expunge it from your heart. I'll expunge it from your life. I'll expunge it from your record through the sinless, shameless, guiltless, blameless blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen out there? So he won't cast you out. Why? Because that day is now this day that he'll wash you clean in the blood of the Lamb, beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ who takes away the sin of the world and not holds them against us. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, I want you to notice in verse 2b the word for. He says, for the Lord Jehovah. Now, that gives us three insights into why we're to exhibit faith and fearlessness in the Lord Yahushua. Now, look at verse 2b. He says, for the Lord Yehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become, notice what he says, my salvation. Now, beloved, notice here, he says, Jehovah is my, number one, personal strength. That word strength is ooze. That is, he is my strong moral and spiritual support. He is my fort. In other words, he's saying he is my high, uh, high tower and my power. He gives me the strength to believe and the strength to persevere and the strength to overcome. Would you say amen out there? But he's not only my strength, he says. He's my zimrath. He's my song. What do you mean, preacher? He's saying he's the melody, the harmony, the symphony of my life and my lips. He's that music that will, I constantly and continuously lift up. For he's saying Jesus is just like a conductor. That's what this Hebrew word means. Just like a conductor does, beloved, with an orchestra, he also providentially orchestrates and arranges and fine-tunes all the things in my life, Isaiah saying, like the notes on a piece of music that a conductor will do. Has God done that in your life? So many things I thought were important to me when I first got saved that have fallen by the wayside. And uh, as you get older, maybe it comes with age, I don't know. But my, uh, my, uh, my heart is fixed like a flint toward the things of God, get it into the kingdom. Everything else is ancillary to me, I'll be honest with you. And I want to take as many of you as I can into the kingdom. That's what God wants me to be, is your under-shepherd. But beloved, I want you to look at verse 5. He says, in my song, but look what he says in verse 5. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Now, so we're to sing, zamer. That is, it literally means we're to melodiously start crooning to melodiously chant and praise him like a singer does uh, when he entertains an audience, only we're to direct it solely to God. Pretend you're Frank Sinatra. Strangers in the night. Okay? God says, I want you to be a crooner. <laughs> okay? I want you to praise me. I want you to chant, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Sing it. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Here you now. The Bible tells me so. Oh, would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, we're to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, aren't we? The Bible says we're to come in his presence singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But why should we do that? Notice, for his excellent things, he says, gay youth. Beloved, that word gay youth means his royal and regal things that he's done. It means, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the grand and majestic things that he's done, the magnificent, salvaic things he's done for us during this messianic age and era of faith that we now live in. Oh, how blessed we are. Isaiah says that that day is now this day to sing and praise the Lord. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to sing praises to God? You know, you get yourself down in the dumps. And you start singing to the Lord. And I do all the time, beloved. My father used to call me a Jew. Were you a Jew? I walk around and I'd be talking to myself and, and uh, singing to the Lord. I also want you to notice in verse 5, beloved, that we're to make known. That word known, you're there. That is, we're to confess and reveal and instruct others in the knowledge of God's divine and superior moral and spiritual qualities and attributes and excellencies of what? First of all, of his nature. Number two, of his uh, 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 character, beloved. And number three, listen to me now, of his salvation. Now hear me, you hear me now. What Isaiah is speaking about here is the fulfillment of the great commission going forth throughout the ends of the earth so that multitudes can be saved by Yahushua. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the Great Commission right here. Amen. You see, beloved, he's saying that uh, that day is now this day to preach the good news of the gospel to others about him. And that day is now this day to be able to witness and testify to others about him. And that day is now this day, beloved, to talk uh, about him to others, to fulfill the Great Commission, lest multitudes in this world, beloved, ever fail to grace and darken the doors of God's heaven and kingdom in that day. And there will be multitudes. You see, we all like to think that God is just, because he is pitiful, beloved, he's pitiful for those who have a heart for the things of God. But he's also holy and he's just, and he can't, he can't change his nature. And he certainly can't change his word. And we know that the whole world is not going to be saved. God, the purpose of this church age is God to call out a remnant of people for his name. He's calling every day. We're preaching the gospel. You preach the gospel. Churches preach the gospel. That's the purpose of it. So somebody says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, I, am I lost? Yeah, I guess I am. I, 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 I don't know where I'm going in life, what I'm doing in life. I mean, what's the purpose of life? And then you come to know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, it's so wonderful to know that Jesus Christ loves us. And so he's saying to us, beloved, that that day is now this day. You listen to me now. While we still have time before the doors of God's, golden doors of God's probation slam shut on the silver hinges of his mercy and grace and masses of people be lost. Jesus said this when he resurrected, Matthew 28, 18. He says, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Would you say amen out there? In other words, he said, get to work, get to work, get to work, preach the gospel. Fulfill the Great Commission. That's what I want you to do. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, that message that he's talking about here is an urgent message. It's something that everybody absolutely needs to hear, even though they may not want to hear it. The Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 6 2. He said, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Not next week, not next month. Not next year, beloved, like a lot of people will put it off. Today's the day to preach the gospel and make it universally known throughout the whole world so those who God is calling get saved. Amen. Jesus said it like this in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. He says, Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Go preach it to every creature. Now he's not talking about going to preach it to the lizards, okay? He's talking about moral creatures. God says, go and preach the gospel. So, beloved, we've seen that Jehovah is my personal strength in song, but there's a little third sub-point here. He tucks in in verse 2. It's the word salvation. Notice what he says, beloved, salvation here. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has also become, notice what he says, my salvation. Two times he uses the word Yahushua, salvation, beloved. Now here Isaiah uses the verb form of this word, and he's referring to the person and work of the Messiah himself as coming as our Lord and Savior. So he exhorts us to say, Yahushua, Yehovah, is my divine helper. Yahushua, Yehovah, is my divine provider, my divine deliverer, who gives me salvation who gives me eternal life, who gives me victory in the spiritual battle over all of my enemies. He says, he has now become my personal Lord and Savior. So therefore, notice what else the prophet exhorts and encourages us to do during this messianic age and era. Look at verse 3. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. He's saying that that day is now this day to draw water out of the wells of salvation. Shahav my mayan Yahushua. That is, right now during this church age is the time to uh, constantly and continuously pull and dip and drink out of the springs and brooks and rivers of salvation while they're still flowing. Amen? You see, this is the only salvation God has provided through His Messiah for man. In Isaiah 55, 1, and I love this verse. I'm not going to give you the whole thing. But beloved, Isaiah says, oh, 
Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. That is, beloved, the drink of Yeshua's salvation. You see, our Lord Jesus Christ echoed this divine invitation to come and draw and drink from the wells and rivers and fountains of your salvation. In John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, the Bible says, He cried out, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth in me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hey, beloved, that day is now this day, right? Now's the time. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Oh, are you thirsty for Christ's salvation? Thirsty for His Holy Spirit? Thirsty for His Word and His will and His ways? Are you thirsty, ladies and gentlemen, for eternal life? You say, preacher, I'm thirsty. My, my heart is parched. What do I do? Then you need to dip into the well of His salvation. What should I do? Then you need to draw from His river of salvation. What should I do? And you need to drink from his fountain of salvation. Oh, listen carefully, beloved. That day is now this day to dip and to draw and to drink of his salvation. Amen. Don't you delay it. So, we've seen that that day is now this day. It means that point number one, it's a day of consolation. Point number day, two, it's a day of salvation. And I'm going to finish this. <laughs> point number three, it's a day of declaration. I want you to look at verse three and then drop down to 4b. A day of declaration. Look what he says in verse 3. Therefore, in light of what I've said from verses 1 and 2, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Now drop down to verse 4b. He says, declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Beloved, note the two things we're exhorted to do here. We're to do it on both a personal level and Isaiah showing us on a public level. In other words, both in our own hearts and publicly, we're to make the Lord's doings, His actions, His activities, His undertakings, redemptive undertakings, known in both our private devotions and also throughout the whole earth. Isaiah says that that day is now this day to do it. But you say, preacher, how do I do it? Well, let me give you a couple of subpoints here. Number one, by praying in His name. It says, call upon His name in verse 4b. The words call upon His name, kara, means to invite summon, bid and beckon the Lord Jesus Christ in your personal and prayer life to come into your heart and acknowledge that He alone is your Lord and Savior. And God says, don't delay to do it. Do it now. Not, you know, I've been in sin. Repent of that sin and get it right. Say, Lord, come in, forgive me. Fill me with your grace. Fill me with your spirit. Pour your mercy out upon me. Would you say amen? Oh, beloved, what an age is... Isaiah is looking down the corridors of time in the far off distant future, and that day is now, this day, this church age in which you and I are living. Would you say amen out there? You know, beloved, the Apostle Paul said this about uh, confessing Jesus as our Savior. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, he says, That thou shalt confess the Lord Je- with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with a heart, Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The Bible says that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, beloved, I want you to notice that it's in the present tense. It's not called once. It's not confessed him once. It is a constant and continuous process in their life. We're calling, we're confessing, we're praising, we're talking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, you get this. If you ever want to be saved and sanctified... What do I do? Then you must pray and confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you ever want to be resurrected, if you ever have, want, want to have a glorified, immortal body, then you must pray and confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you ever want to have eternal life and live in the eternal kingdom of God, then you must constantly and continuously and daily pray to God and confess Him as your Lord and Savior. He's Jehovah Yahshua. Would you say amen out there? Oh, beloved, when I think about what Jesus said, how we must call upon his name if we want to be saved. Oh, poor Nicodemus, I think about this religious Pharisee. Can you see him coming to Jesus, this parapetetic preacher, dirty, filthy, looked like nothing, just like a fisherman or a carpenter or some laborer? And he comes to Jesus, and Jesus looked right into his eyes and down into his heart. You see, Nicodemus had been looking for the Messiah all of his life, only he didn't know it. 
So when Nicodemus came to him and said, Master, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do us these miracles that thou doest. He said, God be with him. I can see Jesus saying, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again if you ever want to see or enter into the eternal kingdom of God. Would you say amen out there? Now he got saved, ultimately, praise the Lord. I don't know how long after that conversation he did, but I love Peter. Peter had been arrested. He was a jailbird. He had been preaching at Pentecost. This man denied Jesus. Now he's standing boldly for the Lord. And so they said, you, you, you can't preach that down here. We're, we're sick of you. They lock him up and they beat him. And he comes out and they said, you don't preach in this name anymore. And in Acts 4.12, Peter says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must, whereby we must, whereby we must be saved. Would you say amen? And they locked him up again. <laughs> Neither is salvation any other. I'm not trusting the rabbi. I'm not trusting Ananias or Caiaphas. I'm trusting Jesus and him alone. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, by praying in his name, also by pro proclaiming his name. Look what it says in verse 4b. He says, declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Now, the, the words to make mention, zakar, of his name means we're duty-bound to publicly remind and cause people to both hear and keep in remembrance in their minds the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, beloved, we must never be ashamed to publicly declare Yadah, that is to boldly announce, pronounce, and proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and confess Him as our Lord and Savior and the only Redeemer of the world. Oh, beloved, I can't tell you how very and vitally important this is that we publicly do this, especially when everybody today is trying to denounce and demean the Lord Jesus. You know, when people, when I witness to people, they say, you're one of those Jesus guys, you know what I say? I say, let me tell you who Jesus is. This is how I say it. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of the living God. I don't just say He's my Savior. I say He's the eternal Son of the living God. He's God in the flesh, and He died on the cross for my sins. In other words, I don't want them to make any mistake about it. He's more than a prophet. He's more than a great saint. He's more than a great rabbi. He's more than a great teacher. He's the eternal son of the living God incarnate. I don't want them to ever, I want them, when they walk away from me, I want the Spirit of God to drive it home. Now, I don't say it as passionately as I do when I preach. But I let them know, beloved. You know why? Because the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written in the Old Testament, in the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live, how? By faith. So, beloved, we need to publicly stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in Matthew chapter 10, Verses 32 and 33, Jesus said this, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father in heaven. But then conversely, he said, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father in heaven and the holy angels. So what are you saying to me, preacher? I said, don't you ever be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ, the public and confess his name, beloved. Because if you do, it could cost you your soul. Remember, we live coram deo. That's the Latin phrase. In his presence, under his authority, and according to his word. We live coram deo. Always in the presence of the Lord. Would you say amen out there? Instead, beloved, notice what he says in verse 4 also. that uh, It says that his name is to be exalted. Sagav. That is, we're to publicly defend it. We're to set it up before folks as being high and holy and lifted up, higher than the name of politicians, higher than the name of any educator, higher than the name of any scientist or any other religious leader like Buddha or Confucius or Muhammad. And beloved, you hear me now, it's higher than the name of Mary. It's higher than the name of saints. It's higher than the name of popes. It's higher than the name of Pastor Joel. Well, that's hard to believe, but that's true. Infinitely higher, beloved. That day is now this day to call upon his name. That day is now this day to confess and declare his name. 
And that day is now this day to exalt His name. Beloved, His name is to be loved and revered by all men. Amen? Now, you want me to continue? Thank you. Okay, point number four, and I'll close. Sharp point. Beloved, we've seen that it's a day of consolation, a day of salvation, a day of declaration, but it's a day of exaltation also. You try preaching through a psalm like this. <laughs> I mean, a song like this. Look at verse 6. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Notice the elation, jubilation. Notice the celebration and the publication the saints ought to have during this church age for two reasons. Number one, because they're residents of Zion. In verse 6a, cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion. Now, that goes to the inhabitant of Zion, Yasab Sion, that is, you who dwell in God's Zion, you who live and abide in God's Zion, you who remain in God's Zion. Now, Zion was the capital city of God's earthly, and it is of his eternal Jerusalem, beloved, where God himself now lives and dwells. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Zion so you can understand it. Zion was the prominent hill on which Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, was built, and there's where God dwelt in the Holy Temple. So there was five hills, but the highest hill was Zion. That's the capital city, and that's exactly where the temple was built and where God inhabited that. That's why it's called Zion. Now that Zion typifies the heavenly and new Jerusalem where the saints will forever live with God. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 through 4, it says this, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And the Bible says, in the blood of sprinkling, it speaketh better things than that of Abel. Amen. We've come to the heavenly Zion. My heart isn't fixed on earthly Jerusalem in the Middle East. My heart's fixed up there. How about yours? How about yours, saints? Up there? Okay, that's the heavenly Jerusalem that God says. But notice what he says, beloved. We're to cry out. Saul. That is, we're to loudly and cheerfully and rejoyfully. And then he uses the word shout. Ranan. That is to yell and bellow and holler out to the top of your lungs. Then I love you, Jesus. I long for you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I will live forever with you, Jesus. Beloved, this is the day we're supposed to be doing that. Amen. That day is now this day. So that's point number one, the residents of Zion. But notice, because of the Redeemer of Zion, he says in verse 6b, For great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. We're to shout because of his greatness. Gadol, that is his divine majesty, his splendor, his divine grandeur, beloved, as the creator and redeemer, as the lover of our souls who chooses to live with us. And notice what he says in the very midst, that is Kareb, that is the most central and inner core and heart of the church and of the Christian and of the eternal kingdom of God. And beloved, he will always be with his people in the new heavens and the new earth. Amen? And 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And by the way, uh, he's quoting Leviticus chapter uh, 26, verse 12. He says, For ye, God's saying this, For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and, I, and they shall be my people. Now, beloved, listen to me. God had told Israel that all, all the way back yonder in Leviticus chapter 26. That, that's what the temple always typified. The fulfillment of the temple was the Lord Jesus Christ, the greater than the temple. Here now, ye are the temple of the living God. Oh, beloved, that day, that day that Isaiah is speaking about is now this day. Would you say, Amen? It's a day of consolation. That day is now this day, a day of salvation. That day is now this day, a day of declaration and exaltation to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says his name is Emmanuel, he's God with us. Amen the Holy One of Israel, who dwells right in our midst. And that day is now this day. Let's go to the throne of grace.